So our last panel today, uh, scaling up with Slayer 2s and beyond. Uh, we have Samantha Gautam from Alpen Labs, Stephen Ruse from ARC, Chris Lima from Squirrel and Ethereum Foundation, and our very own Hannah for our moderator. So let's give up for them. Awesome, and good afternoon uh, to our uh, speakers, our panelists, and uh, the attendees here. And thank you everyone for uh, joining us for our last panel of the uh, Bitcoin Expo 2024. Um, um, my name is uh, Hannah Shin. I'm today's moderator. I'm a grad student at MIT and a student staff at the Digital Currency Initiative. It's my pleasure to uh, moderate today's panel around uh, scaling up with Layer 2s and beyond. We have a remarkable group of uh, speakers here uh, to discuss uh, the kind of the implications in terms of enhancing scalability in both a Bitcoin and Ethereum ecosystem. So joining us today, we have Samantha from Alpen Labs, as uh, uh, Stephen from uh, Stephen from um, uh, Arc, and uh, Chris from uh, Scroll and Ethereum Foundation. And today's panel, we want to really delve into the technical, economic, and social implications of the latest uh, developments in uh, Layer 2. And uh, we'll first uh, give the speakers the time to uh, introduce themselves, their project, uh, delve into some of the specific questions, and leave time for, uh, for the Q&A. Um, and our goal today is to not just exchange ideas, um, but also foster collaborations and inspire actions that will drive forward uh, the adoption and effectiveness of layer two of solutions in both Bitcoin and Ethereum. So without further ado, uh, let's uh, dip, uh, dive into our discussion and hear from our panelists. So uh, Stephen, we can start from you to introduce yourself and go, go around. Uh, hello, I'm Stephen Roos. I was here yesterday also at the last panel. Um, I used to work at Blockstream on Liquid, uh, which is a sidechain, and currently I'm working on Arc, which is a new layer two protocol that was uh, invented about a year ago. Um, yeah. Cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Lima. Uh, I currently work at Scroll as part of the ecosystem development team. Uh, and for those that don't know, Scroll is a layer two solution for Ethereum. It's ZK EVM focused. So, what that means is essentially tries to be compatible with Ethereum and making sure you can scale it without compromising on decentralization or security. Um, and the Ethereum Foundation, I, I used to work there four years before, uh, the previous four years before I joined Scroll, and I, I still, you know, advise there, but right now Scroll is the main focus. So thank you. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Samantha. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Alpen Labs. Uh, it's a company that uh, was started in 2022 with uh, for MIT grads, actually, so uh, we're, we've, we've been in stealth uh, for, for a while. Uh, we recently uh, just came out. Uh, we've been building scaling solutions uh, for Bitcoin. And specifically, uh, we're leveraging zero-knowledge proofs, SNARKs, as a key uh, technological primitive to uh, really focus on advancing uh, utility of uh, Bitcoin uh, that's through improving privacy, improving scalability, and a uh, key aspect of, of both uh, is also improving expressivity, uh, allowing people to build uh, verifiable uh, on-chain uh, contracts uh, on Bitcoin and with the Bitcoin asset. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, welcome again. Um, so I want to first uh, delve into um, like a like a core uh, like a, a core, core issue that we're all thinking about with like uh, scaling um, uh, the networks. Uh, how do we also ensure and think about like uh, problems around decentralization and security? So could you talk a little bit more about um, how like your like uh, for for different uh, the networks that you're uh, working on? Uh, how does it impact the decentralization aspect for Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum? Is there like a trade-off, for example, in terms of thinking about uh, increasing throughput, uh, scaling up vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, um, kind of uh, compromising some of the de decentralization or the security aspect. Sure, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the Ethereum side. So uh, layer twos are essentially, you know, I think probably most of you are familiar with the blockchain trilemma and sort of, you know, in order to like really build a blockchain, you have to either focus on like security, uh, decentralization, or scalability. Uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, focus primarily on decentralization and security. And so 
that did mean that we had that trade-off of, you know, making the scale to actually, like, make a meaningful impact throughout the world. And that's sort of where, like, L2s on the Ethereum side, you know, came about, uh, where we want to be able to scale Ethereum and not, you know, compromise on those values. Um, and sort of now that we're doing it, we've been building it out for, like, the past, you know, couple of years. Uh, it's sort of in order to scale, there still are some, you know, technical roadblocks that we have to get through. And right now, a lot of the layer twos are still more centralized than we would like. Um, and so what we normally say is like they're currently on training wheels and, you know, the main goal over the next couple of years to really make sure that, you know, L2s are very much decentralized and, you know, adhering to those security values as well. Um, so it's a very open area of exploration, but I think, you know, overall we are achieving the goal of making Ethereum cheaper uh, and much faster uh, while still retaining some of that security that we do care about as well, the, the decentralization. Any other panelists want to comment on this from the Bitcoin side? Yeah. Well, I think from the Bitcoin side, when we talk about the layer twos, we kind of only have the Lightning Network, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, there's there's discussion what layer twos should be. Um, I think in a bit on the Bitcoin world, we usually think of layer twos as something that kind of doesn't really concede on the security model of Bitcoin. Like you don't need any third party to be involved to get your Bitcoin. Um, so like federated side chains are not really layer twos in that definition, but they have been around for a long time. And I think recently with like BitPM and the whole discussion about there, with like people are seeing lots of options using BitPM with like rollups, like lots of stuff obviously is happening with rollups in Ethereum that they might, they might finally like cross over to Bitcoin. And also on the sidechain side, uh, BitPM uh, might enable like bridging that does not rely on third parties uh, finally. Um, but yeah, I think, um, the security of getting back on the Bitcoin blockchain on the Bitcoin side relies a lot on the mempool working out mm -hmm. and like the dynamics on the, on the first layer. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know like what, what I want to add there, but, um, there, there are definitely a lot of unknowns mm -hmm. still because we currently have lightning network, lightning network is yeah. very sensitive to what happens on the mempool. Um, but it kind of works uh, and all the other ones will still have a lot of questions that we need to figure out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what I think is interesting about uh, Bitcoin's design <clears throat> is that uh, it sort of uniquely, I mean, compared, you know, to, to Ethereum and other base layers uh, in, in, in uh, this modular vision of blockchains is that uh, it, it really, the design understood the, the physical reality and physical limitations of global broadcast systems that are you know trying basically peer to peer networks that are trying to come to consensus and so uh, you know the, the result of of that uh, understanding was that you know we shouldn't overload Bitcoin with uh, rich statefulness or arbitrary kind of computation smart contract logic. Uh, and this is this is really important because we're seeing that sort of play out in other blockchains that are, uh, you know, I, I think that didn't take those trade-offs, and it's leading to uh, all sorts of kind of issues around MEV centralization to sort of just kind of bigger risks uh, for the base layer. Uh, but what it also meant for Bitcoin was that uh, you know it's 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 very limited in both the block space in uh, the kind of you know, scripting functionality that we have, what, what we can actually build. And so I, I think the importance of layer twos uh, is especially felt more in Bitcoin because of the sort of constraints uh, that exist at the base layer. Uh, but what's super exciting, uh, we think, is that the, the, you know, the technology that uh, enables that kind of, uh, you know, the, the the escape velocity, if you will, or the Cambrian explosion of, of different kinds of possibilities uh, for uh, sovereign kind of uh, uh, applications with Bitcoin through layer twos are, are now possible. Like those technologies like SNARK, zero knowledge proofs have rapidly advanced uh, in the last decade where now we can start and in, in innovations like BitVM uh, and, and so on uh, can you know, allow us to do interesting things at the layer two level. Yeah, thank you, Samantha. I was actually gonna I uh, was about to ask about kind of the, the why now for uh, for Bitcoin scalability right now uh, that we were seeing uh, in the in past like year or so. Um, Lightning has been around I think for about eight years and now with 
uh, like Snarks and a lot of the new updates, or seeing more more um, innovative scalability solutions. Um, I also like after after we were talking about around kind of like uh, tackling the the trilemma. Uh, I also want to delve into the economic impact um, of kind of seeing these like uh, layer two solutions uh, across the board. Um, for uh, could you could you share a little bit more about what are the, some of the economic impacts? Um, for the overall network and its participants right now uh, for what you're building on and how do you see like in terms of uh, fees uh, and rewards um, and incentives uh, kind of like shifts in the overall like Bitcoin Ethereum ecosystem with uh, more layer twos uh, coming into play? Uh, I don't really know where that goes. I think one aspect there is that obviously like we've been seeing a lot of talks today about mm -hmm. uh, the transaction fees, mining subsidy mm -hmm. and all that stuff that there's a big unknown in Bitcoin, like will we have enough consent, uh, incentive for the miners to actually behave in a way that, that supports the system? Mm -hmm. And obviously layer twos are exactly there to like reduce that, right? Like we all want to pay less fees when we make transactions. We all want to be able to make like regular payments and stuff like that. So we're all trying to work towards reducing those on-chain fees. Like if layer twos really succeed 100%, everyone will make virtually free transactions but then there will be like no no incentive for miners to actually do honest things and they'll all be trying to snip to to fee snipe those tiny fees that are actually being paid so like obviously there's some kind of balance but i think we're totally not near a world where people can make virtually free transactions um lightning transactions might look free but if you count all the things you're paying to like open your channels close your channels rebalance your channels like it's still it's still not not cheap enough mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think we're not anywhere near where layer twos are endangering the, um, the long-term viability of the, of the minor incentives. Yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll speak a little on the Ethereum side. I think for, for Ethereum, uh, the focus shifts to like sort of being more of like the security anchor for a lot of these L2s. Um, I think the, the mainnet and the L2s, there's a lot of collaboration. Like one of the, the recent upgrades for Ethereum was uh, primarily focused on actually like, you know, helping the fees get lowered on an L2, uh, making it much cheaper for an L2 to like uh, have a proof validated on the on mainnet. Uh, so now you've seen the transaction costs for a lot of L2s drop by a 10x uh, value, which is like super important. And so now like the goal is, you know, how do we make it more accessible for people to go from mainnet and really start transacting on L2s? Um, it does present a lot more problems because now the, the L2 landscape is still somewhat fragmented. The tooling to you know, move from one to another uh, creates a very uh, difficult UX for like the end user. So there's still a lot of pain points that need to be resolved there. Uh, but I think you know, overall, like Ethereum is sort of, has done a lot of work already to kind of see how the, the mainnet can still continue to thrive with the L2 ecosystem developing on top of it. Yeah, I just want, I want to add to that from uh, Bitcoin side. Uh, L2s like uh, rollups also enable uh, smart contract functionality. And that is uh, really interesting from the perspective of uh, basically having, like opening up uh, to a lot more utility that can be built on chain. Um, you can't do things like, you know, fault based you know self custody on bitcoin today but with l2s you can uh private transactions i mean much more limited uh but l2s potentially can offer that use of bitcoin as collateral in you know creating a synthetic stable coin uh smart contracts could offer that and so you see this all this new utility that could be possible with l2s i think to you know then what what that actually does is a well designed uh, l2 uh can help the, the economics of being a Bitcoin miner um, are uh, you know, improved basically because you have all of this additional on-chain activity that can happen through the additional you know, expressivity that's possible. And so I think, I think it's gonna be very beneficial going down, downstream to the miners because they're supporting you know, Bitcoin being a really strong settlement network and uh, L2s offering the kind of additional expressivity that's possible in all this on-chain activity that's possible. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and so we uh, like delving a little bit more into like both, I think for, for example, uh, first of all, for Ethereum, like uh, for this particular cycle, like restaking has been 
um, like a pretty major topic, both uh, when it comes to like economic incentives and also network security, right? Um, Chris, could you, could you share a little bit more about like what Squirrel is like thinking on, the, on that? And I think for on the Bitcoin side, like do we see like similar things, like same things happening? What are some of the, the prospects? And uh, yeah, I mean, I guess to delve in, like for, for us, the, the main thing, a lot of it is right now centralized. So like, you know, we're not, it's not like a, an immediate pain point for us, but it's, it's definitely something in our roadmap, especially as we want to like decentralize uh, the sequencer and the prover network and make it more accessible for others to participate in the network. Um, I think there, there are always risks. I think the, like, the amazing thing from like the Ethereum researchers is that they really take a lot of time and due diligence to really like, you know, take into account what are the possible scenarios, worst case, best case. Uh, and it's, it's a very like all had in a public forum. So, you know, a lot of these, these things are really gone through a very robust uh, security measures. And, you know, I think they've just done a great job, like switching from like uh, proof of uh, proof of work to like proof of stake. Uh, that was a very, very long process that involved a lot of people. Um, and so, yeah, I think overall, like what we've seen is that the Ethereum uh, core team has, has done a really good job. And overall, like these are things that they are taking into account. And a lot of it, you know, if you are interested in learning about it, you can read about it on like ETH research and, and you know, see what are the trade offs that they're currently discussing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how do we uh, feel about POS on uh, Bitcoin and the restaking side? Uh, I, I cannot really talk for that, I think. I mean, Bitcoin obviously will never have that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, not 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 for Bitcoin, but in, in, I think in thinking about um, do you, do you think like would there be do you see any interesting anywhere any attempts for uh, for staking restaking um, type of a, uh, initiatives? Well, I mean, like I said, BitVM is like re reigniting the mm -hmm. excitement around sidechains, right? Mm -hmm. And what BitVM is solving on the sidechain side is the bridging, like mm -hmm. how to get your money from main chain to the sidechain and all that. But that leaves the question of how does the consensus on the sidechain mm -hmm. work? And I guess there's projects that are thinking about using proof of stake with Bitcoin as stake to to do their consensus on their sidechain. There's there's been a lot of research over the years on how to do sidechain consensuses, like for specific for Bitcoin sidechains, like space chains and whatever Ruben Sumpson came up with. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I think there will be a variety of different things. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if proof of stake will be the the good or the bad contender there. Yeah. Cool. Cool. I think that. Yeah, I, I would also chime in though. I think that's like one of the cool things about L2s is that mm -hmm. you can experiment with a lot of these things and see mm -hmm. the mechanisms actually work uh, in production. And I think you know that's that's where you see a lot of like the researchers kind of like, all right, you know, we don't want to mess with either Bitcoin, Ethereum itself, but like, what if we were to do this on an L2 uh, and kind of see how the network operates uh, before you know doing something that could like potentially mess up everything yeah. at the main layer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also uh, when I was naming the panel, that's why I said layer twos and beyond, because uh, I think the definition of layer two and, and the experimentations um, is definitely something. Yeah, like we, we want to make sure we uh, in, incorporate a different types of uh, perspectives, but also like yeah, I think uh, how, how we define a Bitcoin layer two is um, is, is definitely um, an interesting topic. Um, and so on that note, uh, by introducing a lot of like, these like expressive L two systems. I'm curious, like, do you see something like, uh, like uh, MV, MVV be, uh, being introduced to Bitcoin? Well, MVV is actually, you want to talk about MVV? Sorry. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah MVV is actually something I kind of wanted to bring up last panel about covenants mm -hmm. because there's a lot of thought around covenants that they're dangerous. And MVV is actually one of the things I think we should think about at least. Um, obviously, um, MVV is actually a topic for an entire talk, but the like the Ethereum system and the Bitcoin system are vastly different, and actually the MEV problem that that or the existence of MEV on the Ethereum side stems from the exact difference is that in Ethereum your transaction signs off on what you want to do, like an action, but it doesn't take into account what the state is you're gonna apply that action on. So like someone who has the power to like shuffle the different actions can actually interfere with what state these actions are going to be on because if this action goes first and then this one then the state is going to be different mm -hmm. and you as a transaction execute executioner like as a user don't have any control about asserting what the state is that you have so like by, by default on ethereum you have like full mev because the state is totally unknown you have your action and then you have the post state 
And with Bitcoin, you have currently zero MEV because every transaction commits to the exact previous transaction. So like the, the entire previous state in Bitcoin is always 100% fixed. <laughs> and when we're talking about Bitcoin covenants, like the very simplest kind of covenant thing that came up first was like uh, any prevout or suggestion no input where you basically <laughs> remove that like hard peg because now there's no hard commitment to the previous state because it could be like any previous transaction. I mean, this is like a very, very, very soft form of allowing mm -hmm. MEV because mm -hmm. like you're still the value and I mean, there's, there's very little variance. But if you're thinking about more generalized covenants, um, you're like thinking about loosening that, that state transition concept. But I think the fact that Ethereum starts from the bottom and like needs to like add things to like control their MEV and with Bitcoin, we, we started like no, no MEV possible. And then we like loosening this like a little bit more and more. I think we, if we get the right mindset and think carefully about MEV, we can get to a situation where it's easier for developers to create applications on the Bitcoin side that will be less susceptible to MEV than mm -hmm. it is on the Ethereum side. Because on the Ethereum side, you actually have to add all the MEV protection measures. Mm -hmm. While on Bitcoin, you just loosen less. That's what I feel. But I, MEV is definitely something the Bitcoin ecosystem needs to think about um, in the next few years. Yeah, and, and to maybe add like that the type of MEV that's concerning is like one where it increases uh, centralization of, of block production. So like who can actually produce the blocks? Um, miners are you know shipping off that block production to like some handful of uh, highly capable uh, uh, entities that that basically you know can extract the most value and and therefore like all miners are just basically going and 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 sending it to them to to do uh, like that that's when it's like like I think you know from systemic level that's like kind of that's really bad right you have you've introduced a lot of centralization around block production um, of course there's you know MEV is also really annoying for for users etc. Um, but I think that the, the flavor of MEV to, to really be uh, vigilant about uh, would be that, I think. Yeah, and I, I think for, for Ethereum, I, I know MEV, MEV continues, continues to be a, a headache. Um, and But I think the good thing is there, there are a couple of options, especially like, um, you know, Ethereum, we have a lot of solo stakers and you have a lot of people like, you know, they mentioned that are, are probably more equipped to do a lot of like the MEV searches. But overall, I think the... Like what they are doing now is um, really creating tools for allow like individuals that are uh, you know doing this on their own to, to try to be somewhat competitive. It's still not an ideal solution. Uh, there's a lot of research that's being done. There's a, a new org uh, called uh, the PBS Foundation, which has been funded by like Vitalik and a couple of other organizations in the Ethereum community to like really focus on on solving a lot of like these MEV issues that Ethereum is having. Uh, it's still very early on, but I, I think, you know, it's something that, you know, we want to make sure we are uh, addressing, especially like on a layer two. It's not something that we really have to deal with because uh, most of the, the sequencers are being run by the, the projects. So you know, you're, you're trusting them not to do that. Uh, but, you know, when again, when you want to get to a point where you open it up to everyone, you want to make sure like it's been addressed somewhat. And so a lot of the research is going to sort of make sure when we get to that point, uh, we can address it in a more efficient way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and wait, do you want to? Okay. Yeah. So I want to switch gears a little bit uh, to uh, talk uh, more about user experience in the dev ecosystem uh, with uh, with the, uh, like uh, uh, more layer twos uh, coming up. So first of all, um, with like you know we're seeing so many like newer like layer twos of varied uh, designs and capabilities um, out uh, out there. Like how do you, how do you think about like for example for wallets to adapt into environment where there's so much uh, variety and then what are some of the anticipated interoperab uh, interoperability challenges do you see from like um, that angle? If there's, if there's one thing I learned from working on Liquid for several years is that if if the project that if the organization that builds the, the the platform doesn't provide tools for developers to use that platform they will not use the platform. So like one thing that Ethereum has, has going for it is that there's a, there's a tremendously large developer ecosystem with lots of tools and all the like child or whatever parallel EVM chains that are not Ethereum, but just use EVM, get all the, all this tooling mm -hmm. and all these applications and all these like um, developer utilities for free. 
while um, if we're thinking about Bitcoin side chains or Bitcoin layer two protocols, like everything starts from scratch. Like when like building a Bitcoin wallet, but you're building a Lightning wallet, there's almost nothing uh, like similar. It's entirely different. So if we're talking about Arc, um, it's it's also going to be entirely different. If you're talking about side chains like liquid like side chains, there might be like some conceptual similarities, but you cannot use any of the tools. You need to like write mm -hmm. all the tools again. So I think I think developer experience always going to be something that we need to work towards because it's a lot of work to build tools for developers. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, he touched on a lot of great points there. Uh, I think for, for scroll itself, like one of our main goals was to make sure that, you know, everything that you could do on Ethereum, you could do on scroll. Uh, and that's why we like our goal is to be like EVM equivalent. Uh, so you, every the tooling and, you know, the developer libraries that are used to, you can easily port them over and, and use that to build your applications. Uh, additional features like, you know, a lot of like applications on Ethereum are always going through like security audits. And so there's less risk of introducing any like uh, bugs or anything because you're like pretty much just porting over your code base. Uh, from the developer experience, that, that was like top of mind for us, uh, just making sure that the onboarding is super easy and, and, you know, as boring as possible for them so they can just focus on building. Um, for like the wallet and the user experience, I think that's where like L2s have a lot more work to do uh, because scroll is one L2, but then you have others uh, that are in the Ethereum ecosystem and you know, the number keeps growing and then you have like layer threes, which we haven't even talked about. Um, and so, you know, navigating that from like an end user perspective is a headache. Uh, the tooling is like current in development, you know, being able to bridge across different L2s uh, and the wallets, you know, are getting better at recognizing the different networks, uh, but it's still nowhere near as uh, easy as we would like. Uh, there have been some like good in protocol upgrades on the Ethereum side. Uh, you know, we have like ERC four three three seven, which is trying to make smart contract wallets uh, sort of one of the, like the major uh, players in the ecosystem to make it much easier for people to to use wallets. Um, and there's I think three zero seven four, which is another one, another big one to make it easier. Um, but there's still a lot of room uh, for improvement. Uh, it, it's definitely one of like the bigger headaches as, you know, the goal was to have a decentralized network and, and with decentralization is there's so many different options and now you have everyone trying to like test all these different ones and it's not clear which one is going to be the default. So everyone's trying to go and, you know, now we got to figure out a way to like bring it all together and make it easier for the end user. Um, yeah, I mean, so, you know, we, we, for, for our roll-up uh, that we're building, uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about uh, wh what is the smart contracting environment, what what language do we want to support, and uh, this is this is a really hard decision because we were building this over Bitcoin. Uh, you know, understanding you know from our viewpoint, Bitcoin is the most interesting uh, digital asset. It's the most sound money, and and Bitcoin's also you know the best well-designed kind of settlement system, global consensus system. And so we're very much Bitcoin aligned in that way. Um, but the question was, you know, what we're in introducing kind of a smart contracting paradigm on the layer two. How do we think about uh, what to support? And ultimately, we decided to go with EVM compatibility. Uh, and there's, you know, the, the, the thought there uh, for that uh, kind of decision was a lot around the end user experience and the end developer experience. Uh, the reality is that, like, there is, you know, a, a really large... Uh, developer ecosystem, but also this like infrastructure and tooling ecosystem around uh, uh, EVM uh, that, uh, you know, has attracted a, a ton of different wallets, a ton of different stablecoin issuers, a ton of different developers, custodians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot of network effect that that tech stack has had. And so by standardizing more towards that, um, you know, that's, that's kind of where we get the benefits. I will add kind of, you know, we, we want, we, the, the intention is to definitely go beyond the EVM um, as, as, we, uh, as we grow and, you know, come out of testnet and, and, and go into mainnet. Um, we, uh, you know, we're looking at already adding things like account abstraction, which, which you called out, which is going to be really, uh, you know, we think really important for uh, user experience and also gas abstraction uh, and enabling gas abstraction services, which we, we, we've thought for a long time that was kind of a no-brainer for payments uh, as we think about, you know, you know why, why have to pay, uh, if, you're, if you're doing payments for uh, uh, some kind of stable coin, why are you paying additional gas, gas fees in a, in a totally different, uh, you know, native uh, gas token, which in our case is uh, bridged Bitcoin. 
And so, you know, giving the flexibility to the developers to either have gasless transactions or, you know, if, if you're paying someone in stablecoin to pay the fees in stablecoin, you know, th these kinds of uh, user experiences are really important. So we're, we're taking the EVM and kind of adding in even additional kind of new ideas uh, that, that allow for such experiences. Yeah. Um, th and thank you so much. I actually, I, I love where you're like uh, touching upon some of the things I'm thinking in terms of by adding uh, things like EVM or other expressive smart contracts and new use cases. Uh, it's like unlocking for a bit, uh, for Bitcoin. Uh, could you like maybe share a little bit more, like also for Steven, like uh, other like new use cases you have in mind by having like EVM compatibility? And then I, I think for uh, for Chris, because um, Scroll is, I think, ecosystem-wise, like something that uh, like further along the way compared to uh, to uh, Arc and Alpin. Uh, could you sh uh, maybe share a bit more, like in terms of the new use cases and developer um, kind of activities you're seeing in the uh, e ecosystem? Sure. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm happy to to tell that. I think uh, the the main thing for us is, you know, Ethereum has has done a great job of like. Uh, activating the developers, but one of the biggest blockers has always been how expensive it is for a lot of these different use cases. Uh, even something as you know, like a transfer of stable coins, right? Uh, I think for you know regions like the U.S. and Europe, you know, ten cents or something like that, uh, it's not really like that much. But when you want to think about like regions like Latin America or Africa, uh, which has been like a very important uh, focus of Scroll. Uh, we need to get that fee down even lower, uh, talking about like one cent. And so this is where like the layer twos really enable developers to start thinking more of, you know, cheaper fees means we can do a lot more. We're not limited um, by the, 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 the expensive fees on mainnet. So like, you know, that opens up the design space and that allows us to really work with these different communities to like make it more accessible for them. Um, especially, you know, as like the network get congested, like, you know, like to like when the, there was like the whole NFT craze and everything, uh, mainnet was just like unusable for like most people because they just didn't want to pay those expensive fees. Uh, but now with like layer twos, a lot of that has sort of, you know, been alleviated. Um, and now we can do a lot more. Uh, it's faster, it's cheaper. And so, you know, developers are, are really like thinking through like what else they can do here. Um, and so like now I think in the future, we're going to be seeing a lot more stuff like, you know, with stable coins and payments, making that more accessible to people. Um, and just in general, even for like, you know, even like something like NFTs that were on mainnet, you know, it, the interaction on L2 is going to be much different now that it's much cheaper to mint it. Um, so everything is, is just like wide open. And, and we're seeing a lot of that. And like for gaming is like one of the areas where like the cheaper fees is like super important. And we're seeing a lot of development in that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so I mean, like, so for us, um, actually two weeks ago, we, we sort of, we announced uh, our vision and, and kind of came out of stealth. And in the first week, we actually had over 100 projects reach out uh, through our website to build, uh, you know, things that they couldn't have, you know, built directly on the base layer for Bitcoin because uh, of uh, the, the constraints around expressivity. And so, you know, the, just having smart contracts uh, and the projects were, uh, to highlight a few, it was, you know, people that wanted to build uh, better self-custody solutions uh, with, you know, having vaults, uh, access to vaults and more powerful vaults um, on, on the layer two. It was, uh, you know, even folks that wanted to build like on-chain hash rate futures, which would be useful for miners. Um, there, were, there were a couple of projects uh, talking about using Bitcoin as a collateral uh, in interesting ways uh, to create... Uh, uh, you know, different types of, I mean, there's like everything from uh, uh, like sort of options contracts that then enable, uh, you know, uh, algorithmic stable coins um, uh, and, and, and these kinds of applications. So like basically we're excited to see the use of BTC asset and, you know, the, the developers being able to access that more natively in the layer two uh, in a smart contract uh, paradigm. Uh, but we're also really excited to see, I mean, the, a lot of the, you know, the kind of projects I named, you know, are also kind of being developed, I guess, in, in Ethereum and other places. I think there are some totally new and unique projects I'm, you know, would, would hope to see uh, really be born out of uh, the Bitcoin side. Um, I'm, I'm personally really excited about like lightning channels being created on the layer two uh, roll up that has, you know, kind of cheaper cost uh, for, for the, you know, on-chain interaction on the roll up. Uh, it has more expressivity to do interesting things um, 
We're also really excited about uh, potentially uh, you know, other client-side validation protocols getting built up, um, uh, a few mentioned kind of in, in, in talks prior. Uh, so I, I think there will, you know, hopefully be, uh, you know, even as ambitious as, you know, on-chain verifiable uh, Bitcoin money market fund. Um, that could be really exciting uh, as we see maybe yield opportunities, et cetera, that emerge uh, in, in the L2s. Thank you. Very exciting. And uh... So th today, this panel is actually, uh, I think, the only panel for the expo that has both Bitcoin and Ethereum represented. Uh, and yes, yeah, so thank you, Chris, for driving from New York um, to talk more about like Ethereum layer two. So I want to uh, definitely use this opportunity to talk, uh, to ask about ways to collaborate across two like major networks. Could you share a little bit of some ideas or opportunities that you uh, you think could could uh, could uh, exist between uh, your projects, like in terms of collaboration and how do you see like maybe pulling some of the resources or know-hows either on like MEV or other uh, aspects uh, may benefit the scalability and uh, utility of Bitcoin and Ethereum? Uh, well, I guess to start what I already said, there's people building EVM side chains that yeah. want to co-live, like live against Bitcoin. So you can bridge your Bitcoin into like an EVM world. So then we can obviously leverage a lot of code and infrastructure that, e that Ethereum has. Um, I think like the, previous or the talk before the previous talk uh i think in in the ethereum world there's a lot of research about like zero knowledge proofs and snarks mm -hmm. and all those kind of things that in bitcoin haven't really been relevant yet and they might uh they might come and they might like be a part of the the different layer twos that we will see so that's definitely that's more like cryptographic higher level that's not really necessarily uh, ethereum mm -hmm. based but like they've been like doing more more efforts there like other than that i think yeah I think we can learn from the effects on the system that a lot of the applications have, like like decentralized exchanges, like lending, like all those kind of like things where people are trying to gamble or over stuff and trying to win from each other. Like if, if they come to a, a Bitcoin like a system like Bitcoin, what does it mean for like for fees? What does it mean for yeah. uh, mining incentives and stuff like that? Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's like know how crossover, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think ZK is really one area of space that like even beyond blockchain, just as like the design space is, is so huge. And, um, you know, that's been a very important part for Schwarz development, just like the, the advancement in that area alone has allowed us to really scale. Like a lot of people thought uh, this would take at least another three or five years to get and like it's actually here in production, but we still have a long way to go. And I think that ZK is just a space in general that, you know, people should be paying more attention to uh, beyond just like L2's Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, I think one of the cool parts about, you know, both projects is that both are being developed in the open. Uh, a lot of these conversations out there, the researchers are very accessible. Uh, so whenever you do find a topic that, you know, might think is overlap, I'm, you know, I think I would encourage everyone to just like reach out and see like how you can contribute because that's, that's ultimately what it comes down to is like, we have two common a common problem and you know we tackle it in very different ways but a lot of for us you know the reason we all started is is not just because it's bitcoin or ethereum it's you know really trying to change uh the peer-to-peer -peer, uh network and, and really trying to make a difference on the financial systems and so i think that really like brings us ties us all together um and you know whatever area comes out of it i think you know we're always happy to explore it and i, I think for me zk is one of those areas that really is probably a lot of collaboration there and you know yeah yeah, I think I think between at least the different L2s or rollups being developed on Bitcoin, um, one area uh, that I, that's kind of interesting is like using Lightning somehow to uh, b because these you know different rollups or L2s are generally siloed as we see in Ethereum as well. Uh, so how do we you know deal with some of the fragmented liquidity there, or how do we move assets maybe in between different? Uh, Chains, and I think there's, you know, I think Lightning as a maybe an interoperability layer uh, could be an interesting kind of uh, thing to explore. Uh, the other, you know, maybe uh, area of collaboration or uh, kind of, you know, th that that seems kind of in intriguing to me is like uh, uh, in in one of the prior talks before, uh, I think Liam mentioned uh, snarks don't solve everything, but they sort of talk, you know, turn most things into kind of a, eventually you still have some data availability problem. Mm -hmm. um, and and there are ways that like, you know, there you know things like Celestia or like these kind of blockchains exist that are kind of trying to tackle the, the, the data availability problem for rollups. 
Um, it'd be interesting to see maybe a more Bitcoin native version of uh, uh, how to tackle that and, and maybe something that's shared across uh, different rollups uh, uh, or, or like a Bitcoin secured version of, you know, tackling a data availability uh, um, problem. So I, I think those, maybe those two things are interesting. Yeah, certainly. Um, and uh, and we're, so we're uh, approaching towards the end of the panel. So I'll ask one last question and open it up for uh, questions from the audience. If you do have questions, feel free to start lining up uh, over there. So uh, yeah, to, to wrap up our uh, kind of a panel discussion uh, and the, the expo uh, content side in general, like looking forward uh, five, 10 years from now, how do you envision what you're building on to impact um, like Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum ecosystem um, respectively? What kind of um, changes do you envision in terms of scalability, uh, functionality, and like user experience use cases? Um, or what's where you're uh, working on? I, I can go first. Um, I, I mean, like I said, our, our main goal is to make uh, Ethereum and make it cheaper, faster, and really make it usable for the, the whole world. Uh, I think for me, the like the main thing I would want to see is is sort of you know abstracting away this conversation of like blockchains and L2s. I think for the end user, they shouldn't really have to know what blockchain or L2 they're on. Like you want to make sure like at that point they're just like interacting with different applications and sort of the blockchain that they're using is, is sort of in the background. Uh, but they're still able to like verify, you know, that they are, you know, using the right one and everything like that. But uh, I, you know, the fact that we still have to say like, oh, this is on blockchain or this is on that is, is still like a huge pain point because that just introduces friction. And so the more we can be in the background and like doing all this so the end user can just focus on using a, a product that is safe, secure, and, you know, decentralized, I think that that's where we would want to see it eventually um, and not have to worry about, like, these high fees or congestions and, and anything like that. Yeah, I think if I speak uh, for ARC, I think ARC as a, as a goal is primarily focused right now at just payments, like making Bitcoin payments, like, more user-friendly and cheap. But generalized, it, it kind of mimics a lot of the behaviors of Bitcoin itself. So a lot of applications that could be built on Bitcoin could be built on Arc then as a, like a third layer or something. Um, so yeah, I think that's 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 exciting. I mean, it's gonna enable a lot of like Bitcoin-like use cases uh, with lower fees. And I think more general, like all the stuff that's happening like in different altcoin spheres, it's excited to see them come to Bitcoin because I mean we all know Bitcoin is a real currency. Everyone knows cats are more real than unicorns, so uh, that's exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really hard to predict kind of the applications that will exist. I definitely want to see like a better sovereign bank um, built through Bitcoin that's accessible uh, for, for the world. Uh, but more generally, I'd just like to see creative innovation kind of explode in, in Bitcoin and, and that done through layer twos uh, where developers have access to really secure BTC and, uh, and a sort of, you know, an ecosystem that is, uh, yeah, you know, secured through Bitcoin as the you know settlement network, uh, and mm. and 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 programmable, which which unleashes this kind of creative innovation. So I hope to be very surprised, even with the kinds of applications and things that you know people build out there that you know I hope I can't even envision today. Yeah, cool. And yeah, hopefully, like five years from now, we're not talking about using blockchain apps, but just like apps right like i'm not talking about using internet apps these days um yeah and then with the programmability uh for next year's hackathon which will announce the winners very soon we will see more uh like new use cases and projects come, coming out of it yeah so um i do have like personally i have some questions we touched a little bit about like layer three and there's privacy things um but definitely one the, the, to have the audience um like uh, raise any questions do you have first Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, I was actually just curious to learn a little bit more about ARC and um, uh, whether it helps. Lightning is great, but the main problem is that creating channels uh, on the on-chain be very high, difficult, et cetera. Um, does ARC actually reduce that part of the fees as well? And I just wanted to understand the mechanics there that enable that a bit more. Yeah, I mean, the main problem that our kind of like that the, the development of our kind of set out to solve was the inbound liquidity problem, right? So in liquid, uh, in Lightning, if you want to receive a payment and you don't have a channel, you, you just can't, right? 
So you first need to convince someone else, like an LSP or someone else, to open a channel with you, which costs money, to put some liquidity on their side of the channel, which costs them liquidity, and then you can receive a payment. So that's kind of like a, a pain point, especially when you want to onboard new users or when you're talking about smaller values and stuff like that. So Arc doesn't have that problem. In Arc, you can just open your wallet, you have nothing, and then someone sends you a VTXO, like a transaction, and then you have something. So you don't have this like setup cost. You don't mm. like the liquidity comes from from your provider, from your service provider. Um, so yeah, that's that's the main like benefit over Lightning that uh, that Arc has. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or if you want more details. Yeah. Uh, I guess I was curious to learn a little bit more about the security model. Um, I, mean, I guess yeah. I was curious to learn a bit more about Arc, but yeah, I didn't have a talk here. Maybe just the security model. Yeah. yeah, go on. No, I, I guess the like Lightning and uh, kind of Ethereum roll up familiar with, but Arc I was kind of more curious to understand more. Yeah, so the, the security model is kind of similar to, to, to Lightning. So like if you have a Lightning channel, you have transactions that are off-chain transactions, and if you want your money back and your partners, your channel partner is not there, you need to go on-chain, right? So in Arc, it's, it's, it's more like a hub-and-spoke model, so everyone is kind of talking with the same service provider or with like one of very few service providers. And if you want your money back and your service provider is not, is not cooperating, you also need to go on-chain, and you have a series of transactions that you can use to go on-chain. So it's like the same security model in the sense that you have you have valid Bitcoin transactions you can put on chain to get your money back. Um, the main difference and the main problem that Arc has is that in Lightning, usually depending on how many HLCs you've been going on, it's like two or three transactions is sufficient. And in Arc, it might grow to like a series of five, six, seven or eight transactions, um, depending on how many users there are. So that's, that's something where it's even more mempool or fee rate uh, um, sensitive. But I mean, on the long term, um, things like BitVM, things like Matt are looking promising to also reduce that to like a constant factor um, number of transactions. That's very like different design for Arc. Currently, it's like the main difference with Lightning is that you need more transactions on the chain. So you rely more on your service provider to be online. Yeah, just curious. Um... Why is uh, BTC in general more uh, designed in a way that's more resistant to MEV? Because you can treat them like they're white-hat hackers to how like transactions and work. Wait, I, um, can you repeat the question? We yeah, couldn't really could, hear you. you. Yeah. Sure, I mean, just generally, w w what's the rationale behind why I think anything that comes out of Bitcoin is generally designed to be somewhat resistant to MEV? Like, cause, um, you can almost treat them like they're white hat hackers and then learn from them. Or do you think that's because Ethereum is doing that, maybe BTC doesn't need to do that? I think more for Steven, I think. Yeah, you oh, okay. I didn't that. understand the question. Can you just, can you, can you maybe repeat, repeat yeah. it if you understood? I mean, is it the issue that, that you can't hear me or is it just confusing? Uh, yeah, yeah, there, I think there's a little bit of mumbling if you, you don't mind speaking a bit. Slower. Just, okay, I can just project it just yeah. a little bit better. Right, so I'm curious about. This is a pretty high level question. Maybe I'm not understanding exactly what how BTC works, but in general, why is BTC often designed in a way that's doesn't create a lot of MEV? Like, uh, MEV searchers, right. well, mm. I mean they're high purpose traders, but like you can treat them like they're white hat actors to a certain degree. Mm. Yeah. Right, so I'm just curious whether that was taken into consideration when you're designing MBC tools, <coughs> or because Ethereum's already doing that, you can, you can just learn all the lessons from that. Yeah, but I mean, the, the lessons from then are that MEV sucks and they're trying to solve it, right? I mean, so <laughs> like if, if we can build applications in a way that we never have that problem, that would obviously be better. Um, I think the, the main exit point is that for a user, obviously MEV is like a loss, right? Like it's kind of an extra fee that, that you pay. It's like a money that you should, that you could avoid not to have paid. So I guess if, if as an application developer, you have a way to make your application MEV prone or MEV resistant, you obviously want it to be MEV resistant because your users mm -hmm. will pay lower fees, right? Mm -hmm. So if from the ground up, we are careful about the different primitives we introduce and, and to make sure that there are ways to make our applications less prone to MEV, that's going to benefit everyone. Uh, of course, not the big, the my, the biggest mining pools who would kind of like benefit from MV, but like everyone else, kind of wants to have MV resistant applications. 
So I, I hope that answers your question sufficiently. Uh, yeah, but like in Bitcoin, like the, the fee that you pay to the miner is like you basically give it to the miner, right? Because you, you, you sign off on it. So I, I don't call it MEV because the miner doesn't extract it. He just gets it, right? You, 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 you grant it to him. Mm -hmm. While with Ethereum, the actual value that goes in different places depends on the execution of your transaction. And you might not entirely know what that execution will result in by the time you're sending it to the network. Because the state that you think currently is a state your transaction will be executed on might be different by the time it's actually ending up in, in the blockchain. So there you have this like extra space for someone who knows a lot about your transaction and how the state works to like do some wiggling and then actually your transaction is going to like have different results than you expected, right? And on the Ethereum side, there's things you can do to like put assertions on the state, but you need to explicitly like add those assertions, add those checks to make sure that like MEV is like less or, or less possible. And maybe on the Bitcoin side, we can we can try and build tools where we don't need to like worry about it that explicitly, and we can just make sure that we don't create those situations where. And I'm not I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that's possible, but like we need to be conscious about that and, mm -hmm. and, and think about that. Uh, maybe we can uh, chat also like more uh, kind of uh, like yeah like off stage uh, with if you're interested in learning more about uh, Arc, Squirrel, and Alpen. Um, yeah, thank you all like panelists for uh, for a great talk. Yeah, appreciate uh, insights.